Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. Every four years, Major League Baseball puts on the World Baseball Classic. The baseball equivalent to the World Cup. It gives us a chance to see the best players in the world. When I found out Israel was going to have a team, I thought it was a pipe dream. I never thought it was going to happen. We've got Zai, we've got Baker, we've got Bleich. Everybody needed to be Jewish, so there's no big name recognition. Jason Marquis. He was in Disneyland with his kids. He said, you know what? I'm looking to make a comeback, and maybe this could be the comeback. We all have a chip on our shoulder. Uh, I'm very excited. Should I look at you or should I look up there at the game? one. Mike Davis with a drive deep to right center field. One thing about playing for Israel. Mazel tov. A lot of people don't like Jewish people. I hope one day they'll have, you know, a Palestinian team from throwing stones. For those of you who don't know, there was a terror attack. Oh my god. Yeah. Why you come here to Israel and not stay in America? You guys are going to be Israeli warriors. We were 200 to 1 favorites to win the World Baseball Classic. For Team Israel, it's a chance for the underdog to get a crack at the big dog. It's not about my career. You guys aren't unknown anymore. It's not about any of our careers. And you thought all our people could do was finance. It's about something bigger. Can you please explain what the mensch to your right is? That's Jerry Weinstein, my manager. Oh, well, this. I'm Mark Golub. And whether you're a baseball fan or not, and of course, as many of you know, I am a big baseball fan. But whether you're a baseball fan or not, if you care about Israel, it was no small feat that Israel's national baseball team, for the first time in history, won a qualifying berth in the World Baseball Classic, an international tournament run by Major League Baseball, where countries enter teams from around the world. And in many instances, Major League Baseball players join the team that represents their home country or ethnic community. So in the World Baseball Classic of 2017, a number of Jewish Major League Baseball players joined the Israeli team, which was the 41st ranked team in the tournament, making them the greatest underdog in the WBC. But in what's been called a Cinderella story, or David defeating Goliath, as you just saw, Israel defeated Great Britain to qualify for the WBC in Seoul, South Korea, where Israel defeated the number three ranked team, South Korea, the number four ranked team, Chinese Taipei, and the number ninth ranked team in the world, the Netherlands, as Team Israel became the first baseball team to ever go undefeated in the first round of the WBC's main draw. In the second round, Israel played in Tokyo and played its first game defeating the number five ranked team in the world, Cuba, and then lost in a rematch to the Netherlands and then was defeated by the number one ranked team in the world, Japan, to end Israel's run in the 2017 World Baseball Classic, a run that stunned everyone and elevated the game of baseball in the state of Israel. 
and the entire story was captured masterfully in a beautiful documentary film called Heading Home, The Tale of Team Israel, which includes wonderful footage of the American Jewish ball players on Team Israel visiting Israel for the first time. And I'm so pleased to be joined on this edition of L'Chaim by one of the three producers and the director of Heading Home, Jeremy Neuberger. It is wonderful having you at this table. You did a magnificent job. Mazal Tov, congratulations on Heading Home. Thank you, Mark. It was a, a real pleasure to make this film. Did you enjoy it? No. <laughs> Making a film is a terrible thing to do. Nobody in your audience should ever try to do it. Uh -huh. It's just a lot of grief. But it was fun to do. Uh, you had this baseball team. Nobody thought they were going to win. Maybe my friend Peter over here did, but we didn't. And we followed them around. Said, oh, maybe this will be a movie. And then, you know, magic struck. This is one of those Jewish historical moments. Yes. That maybe the first time someone tried to pickle. Yes. You know, just one of these moments in history we knew we were onto something. And we were there for, you know, front row seats. Well, congratulations. We'll talk more about it in one moment. And today, baseball is a growing sport in Israel. So I also have the great pleasure to introduce you to the man at the center of baseball in Israel, Peter Kurz, president of the Israeli Association of Baseball, who's currently working to build two new baseball fields in Israel, one in Bet Shemesh and a second in Ranana, and to build the sport in Israel to the point that one day, the Major Leagues will feature its first Israeli ball player. It is so wonderful to have you, Peter. Thank you so very much. And it must have been a kick for you to see Team Israel take that run in the WBC of 2017. First of all, it's a pleasure to be here. And the whole story that you just talked about, I was having deja vu and everything was going through my head, as it is when I see the film every time. It was incredible. It was an incredible run. It's an incredible service to Israel and baseball, to, to baseball in Israel. Um, the game has expanded incredibly since that time, um, and it's just wonderful to, to, to be part of it. You know, Peter, <clears throat> during the WBC, I'm getting emails every day from Jews who are telling me, do you know, Israel won another round. Right. Israel won another game. Israel won, Israel won, Israel won. For American Jews, it was quite a story. You're an Israeli. Yes. When did you make Aliyah? 30 years ago. 30 years ago. <laughs> You were born where? I was born in the Upper West Side, not far from here, um, in New York. Okay. Was <clears throat> it as big a deal in Israel as it was for American Jews, for whom obviously the game of baseball means something different than it does to Israelis? Today, today baseball in Israel is not a major sport. Right. We have a thousand kids and adults playing the, playing the game in Israel. It's, it's been growing uh, by at least 30, 20 and 30 percent over the last couple of years. Um, so it, it's, it's getting more publicity, it's getting out there. Um, when we won the first game against Taiwan, um, some reporters, Israeli reporters, were calling me up and asking me for interviews. I was, well, there's a seven hour difference between Israel and, 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 uh, and, and uh, Korea. So when we were winning the games at night, it was early afternoon in Israel. Well, by the time we won the second game, they were getting me on radio talk shows, sports talk shows. By the third game, they were waking up all of a sudden and having me on, on sports, on sports uh, TV shows. And by the when we beat, when we beat, uh, when we beat uh, Cuba in the second round, they already had me on the nightly news. So it definitely made an impact in Israel. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody in Israel today can say, what is baseball? You know, is, is it in Israel? Is it here? Everybody knows that baseball now is in Israel. It okay. Made a big impact. By the way, you're not the first person to try to make baseball a reality in Israel. And there was, for a little bit, there was at one point recently, sort of a baseball league where you had teams from various cities, and you had Art Shamsky as yes. a, uh, and you had Ron Bloomberg right. as an also both of as managers of right. various teams. There were not major league ball players playing, but it was it was Israeli ball players, but major league ball players were managers. It did not succeed. By the way, was this Dan Duquette as well? Yes, Dan Duquette was the head of player personnel. Okay. Ten years ago. Let's put it this way. Twelve years ago, a guy named Larry Barris called me up and said he wanted to bring uh, a, a, baseball, a professional baseball league to Israel. I said, you must be crazy. We met in a Starbucks in New York. He gave me his whole idea, his whole spiel. And I said to him, you must be crazy. And two years later, there was a professional baseball league in Israel. It was a, a two-month league, six teams. It was fantastic. There were about 60 games being played all together. Um, they played in Tel Aviv. They played in Petah Tikva. They played in Beit Shemesh. Um, they made three fields just for those games. It was an incredible summer. Unfortunately, after that summer, the guy went bankrupt. He was never to be heard from again. 
Um, a lot of the people who are today involved with Israel baseball came from the IBO. I assume, yes. There, 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 there's a lot of people still around from those times. He made great publicity for us. He left us with a lot of unpaid bills. <laughs> um, but on the other hand, a lot, of that, a lot of where we are today is due to what he did 10 years okay. ago. You've inherited it, correct? I was also around then, so I haven't really inherited it because I I was, I've been in what were you doing baseball then? for about 20 years. I was a secretary general of okay. the IAB, okay. uh, the Israel Association of Baseball. Okay, and he went bankrupt. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> the league went bankrupt. Okay. How is Team Israel formed? Who, 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 how does that happen? Okay, you have to separate the WBC from the regular Team Israel, okay? Because we have national teams that we send overseas to tournaments. We sent three teams this past April to the tournament, the Pony Tournament in Czech Republic. And the WBC team is something different. The WBC team is totally funded by MLB. MLB ah, has, uh, has ah. signed, I've signed away all the rights for the I WBC see. team to MLB. I see. They fund everything, they fund the training be beforehand. Um, they fund all the players, all the uniforms, all the travel. Everything is funded by, by MLB. I see. Totally I did not understand that. Show. Okay. Yes, it's their show totally, completely. Um, although we have to, you know, recruit the players and go out there and speak to them. And uh, it wasn't an easy job. Now it will be a lot easier for the next WBC because of our successes. Okay. And what percentage of ball players were native Israeli as opposed to either Americans or American baseball players? Okay. There were two Israeli passport holders on the, on the recent WBC team. One was born and raised in Israel, Shlomo Lippitz. He lives now in New York, but he, was, he comes every year. He plays for our national team. He's legendary. People in Israel know the legendary Shlomo Lippitz. Shlomo Lippitz once pitched 160 games in, a, in, a, in two games in one day against Great Britain in the finals of the European Championship. So he's legendary. Um, and the second kid, the second player um, is, is Dean Kramer, who um, was born in this country in the United States. His parents are Israeli. He holds an Israeli passport. He learned how to play baseball here. Um, by the way, he's the first Israeli to play in professional baseball because he's playing in single A you know, for the Los Angeles Dodgers. Um, and he's our hope to maybe make it to the major leagues one day. Um, but he comes to Israel every year, every summer. He, comes to, he came to Israel before he was a major leaguer, a minor leaguer. Came to Israel every year, played with our national team, speaks fluent Hebrew. The kids love him. The kids really look up to him. And he's our great hope. I, I give the analogy to, to Tal Brody. Uh, Forty years ago when Tal Brody came to Israel to develop basketball in Israel, I don't think he thought that 35 years would go, go by until the first Israeli was in the NBA. I hope 35 years doesn't go by until I see the first Israeli in Major League Baseball. Okay, so there were two native Israelis yeah, on the and, team. And two coaches, by the way, were Israeli. Okay, right. and how many were Major League ball players? Um, uh, there were about five or six Major League or ex-Major League baseball players. Okay. There were two current Major Leaguers. There right. Sam Fold and Ike Davis, who were the, who, and Ike Kelly, who were the, and Ty Kelly, who were the current major leaguers. Okay. Right. And the others were American mm. ball players who were Jewish. Yes. Yes. Got it. And I had to, I had to, based on the heritage rule, because of the heritage rule of the WBC, um, you could have uh, people who could get citizenship in your country play for your country. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. So Mike Piazza played for Team Italy years ago, um, and I could have, and 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 Sean Green played for us five years ago. Um, but basically, the law of return of Israel is what dictates that. Got so it. The law of return to Israel today is that anybody who has a Jewish grandparent or who's married to someone with a Jewish grandparent can get citizenship in Israel. And then they it's can not play the halakha. For, then they can play on And then they can play for Team Got Israel. Got it. And before I go to share one more question for you, yes. Peter. You make Aliyah. What was your Jewish life in America when you were living in New York that prompted you to want to make Aliyah? I grew up in America. My parents are from Europe. So a lot of my family, when after the war, moved to Israel, and I came to, my parents came to America. So I had a lot of family left over in Israel. Um, there are two things that dictated where I am today in my life. One was in 1967, two weeks after the Six-Day War. As a 10-year-old, I went with my parents to Israel. Um, it was an incredible experience to go all around to Jerusalem. To you went right after the Six-Day War? Two weeks after the Six-Day War. We were on the how first nonstop El Al flight to New York, from New York to happen? Tel Aviv. We had tickets and we went. <laughs> in other words, you were planning the trip ahead of yeah, time. Yeah, we planned the trip ahead of time. Ah. Um, I had been there when I was three years old. And then as a 10-year-old, I went there. It was an incredible experience to be in Jerusalem, to be the Wailing Wall. It was all rubble in front of the Wailing Wall. Yes. It wasn't yet paved yes, or anything. Yes, that's right. And it was an, to go there, to go to Ramallah, to go to Hebron, to go to Bethlehem, to go to all these places with my family from Israel. It was an incredible experience. Your parents must have been caring about Israel. Very much so, very much so. I very much grew up as a Zionist. I was a Zionist because uh, a Zionist, the definition of a Zionist is somebody who sends his son to Israel. Yes. So my father was a Zionist, and I'm also a Zionist. Okay. Uh, and my sister is the legislative director for APAC. So, uh, Lovely. What's her, her name? Esther Kurtz. So we right. definitely keep her in the family. Okay. And the second event that happened to me was 1969. As a baseball fan growing up in New York, the Miracle Mets. And those are the two things that, that have 
dictated where my life is today yes. because I live Although in Israel. The, I'm oh, involved in baseball. Okay, but the Miracle Mets didn't get you to Israel. No, they didn't get me to Israel. Oh, okay. What got me to Israel was uh, was a woman who later on became my wife, who I'm married to today, and she's Israeli. So she was the final stone that put, me, uh, that put me over there I'm in my travels in Israel. What's her name? Ronit. Ronit. Yes. How many children? Three children. Mazal all three, Tov. All three living in Israel today. Mazal Tov. And my son is a, is a coach of our national team. That's fabulous. Yes. Okay. What's your Jewish story? Oh, my Jewish story. So I grew up in Dix Hills, Long Island. Uh -huh. Joel and Shirley Newberger. Uh -huh. We were conservative Jews who bent the rules a little. We had three sets of dishes, dairy, milk, and taken Chinese food. <laughs> uh, we went to shul for the high holidays. I went to Hebrew school. After, uh, after school, Hebrew school? I did that Talmud too. Torah? Yeah, yeah. Did and you then, love it? Uh, Hebrew school, no, but I, I liked uh, Jewish summer camp. So I went to uh, Sprout Lake near Poughkeepsie. It's a young Judea camp. Oh, good uh, for you. And I, I went there forever. <clears throat> I worked there. I went there. My kids go there. And you there. loved it. I loved it. I mean, I met the, the gentleman who's in our film who yes. works for Major League Baseball and my partner, Daniel, who's a co-director on the film. We all went to camp together. Yes. That's how the film kind of evolved. It, it, yeah. It's yeah, a, yeah. It's a, yeah, I'm a child of Jewish, you know, Zionist sleepaway camp. I went forever. My family went. Uh, you know, I think that has had a huge impact in my perspective uh, on Judaism and Israel was going to that camp. I asked Peter, were your parents also into Israel? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, they had, everyone has like these friends in Israel. You don't know how they, you know, they're like a fake aunt and uncle. I don't even know how we're related to them. We're not. But somehow they always would come to America and be, oh, it's aunt, you know. But we had those. And then, you know, my sister and my brother, who are both my elder uh, siblings, they both went to uh, college freshman year in Israel. And we went to visit. So when I was a kid, I also got to go to Israel. The hotel was now not rubble, it was you know, built up a little bit more. It had a lot of moss growing on it, it was lovely. Um, but I went to Israel you know, like eight or nine times as a kid. Uh, it was very exotic and different and interesting and people were in different costumes and I loved shawarma and I just loved the whole experience. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I went to the Jewish sleepaway camp until freshman year of college where I actually went to Israel for my freshman year. That's marvelous. Yeah. You're also married. I am. Children? Yeah. Uh, yeah, two children. Has your family gone to Israel? Yeah, we've taken them a couple times to Israel, which they also love. Because, like I mentioned, my kids now go to the same Jewish sleepaway camp that I went to with my partner Isn't and that, Jonathan May. That's fabulous. Yeah, so their legacy now. We're a legacy family there. Uh -huh. But, yeah, we, we love Israel. Uh, my wife was not born Jewish. She converted to Judaism, which is interesting because when I met my wife, her family were huge Yankee fans. I grew up out in Long Island. My dad, he didn't want to park at Yankee Stadium, so he made us Mets fans. <laughs> now, because we were Mets fans, we were going to Shea. When I met my wife, her grandfather played with Phil Rizzuto. What do you the, mean played? He was on Phil Rizzuto's team before Phil got tapped for the minors. Oh, my goodness. And Phil Rizzuto said in his book, his autobiography, that James Castrotero, that's his name, was the best shortstop I ever knew. <laughs> so I was marrying into a Yankee dynasty. So we made a deal. She converted to Judaism. I became a Yankees fan. And then fair we, trade. Yeah, it's a fair <laughs> trade. Fair tra What's her name? Michelle. Michelle, Michelle. Neuberger. Yeah. Okay, that's lovely. And if Michelle were here now, mm -hmm. and I said to her, Michelle, what's your Jewish identity? Yeah. What would she say? I mean, when you convert to Judaism, they put you through the ringer. So she went to Hebrew school. I had to go with her, you know, on the Upper West Side. We had a conversion process, a Beit Din. She hopped in the mikvah. She was questioned. She was interrogated. The whole uh, schmear. Yeah, she's more Jewish than I am. So uh, she would describe probably that process. And then she later on was bat mitzvah. So I think, you know, we now have... Four sets of dishes, you know, dairy, meat, taken Chinese, and then sushi because that's become more popular. Very so nice. We're keeping up the tradition. Okay. By the way, you have two sets of dishes for kosher? Yeah, we do. Uh, it's, it's kind of symbolic, you know. But it means something to you. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to break with the traditions that I grew up with. I think, you know, I think it gets a little less and less every generation. I'm aware of that. So I really try and push the celebration of the holidays uh, even the, the smaller, less traveled ones. And, you know, we do all of the things that, you know, I grew up doing. With What's the a wooden seder? spoon and the feather, you oh, know. really? The chametz and the, yeah. You, do, you, you go searching for chametz. I do. It's fun. I usually <laughs> just put big pieces of bread everywhere. It works. Yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. And what about your seder? What's a seder like at your home? Oh, well, Passover is my favorite. It's our favorite. Uh, so, first off, I take my whole family on a tour of the Lower East Side every year. 
where we go down to the uh, pickle guys to get some of that fresh made horseradish. My son and I like spicy, so we get jars and jars. There's a guy outside front with a, a gas mask on who's putting the root, making the horseradish. So we get like jars and jars of that. I mentioned pickles earlier, a bunch of pickles. And then, you know, we explore some of the haunts of my parents' childhood in the Lower East Side. Like That's what? where they grew up. Well, you know, the tour is getting less and less places now, but where do we go? We start off at Kosar's, we get a Bialy. Then we go to the Pickle Guys. It used to be Gus's. The Pickle Guys are there now. Then you go up a few blocks to Economy Candy. You get some candy. This is Russ all, and Daughters. This is all food related. Yeah, well, that, you know, was the <laughs> Lower East Side experience. <laughs> Yeah, it's a food crawl. Of I course. see. I we end at Katz's. If you can make it to Katz's at the end of this trip, you're a champ. You're the rabbi. I got it. So, I got it. Uh -huh. But yeah, I mean, you know, that Passover is our favorite because of the foods, probably, and the the story is really kind of fun and interesting to tell each Where other. Where do you live now? Uh, now I live in uh, Yorktown Heights, up in Westchester. Very nice. Yeah. How many people do you have at your seder? Um, it's usually like nine or ten these days. It's my sister's family. My brother lives in Israel. He married an Israeli woman. They live in Renana. They just saw the film played in Renana recently. And, uh, you know, so it's just my sister's family and my family and my parents. Very lovely. Yeah. Very lovely. We used to take in more strangers, not so much anymore. Uh-huh. I think because we started doing it in Jersey where my parents live. And just because, how do, you, how do your kids identify as Jews? Uh, well, they, they also go to the Zionist sleepaway camp. So I think that they're getting uh, more value from the Zionist sleepaway camp and the customs at the camp, which include davening in the morning and keeping kosher, then maybe they do during the year where they're in a very Gentile you know, school district. So I think in the same kind of way that I related. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my son identifies with Israel. Uh, I, my daughter, you know, not yet. My son was just bar mitzvahed. Uh, Mazal tov. Thank you. I, I think you know, they're growing up kind of similar to me, and I assume that's how my dad was. You know, mm -hmm. and just sort of keep passing on these traditions. Do you feel they also have a care, caring about Israel? Um, they do. They do. I mean, these are really difficult times. Yes. Uh, so you, as a kid, especially, you're hearing all sorts of things coming from different people at school. But they, they know they have family there. They've been there. They've seen the sites there. And they know that they have a place of a, a homeland. They feel like there's a place outside of this country they can go to where they're accepted and they can call it a home. That's fun. By the way, Peter, as you're mm -hmm. listening to this, any thoughts at all? Because you're here, you are an American, right. and you're also an Israeli. Yes. And you understand the bridge between the mm -hmm. two. But as, as you hear Jeremy talk, any thoughts come to your mind? It's interesting, because I'm trying to compare. His kids are probably a lot younger than my kids. My kids are already older. Um, but my kids are also living both worlds, because my son and my, my two daughters, they used to come to America every summer. They used to go to camps. They used to be with their grandparents here in, in, in New York. Um, and, and so they also live that American and Israeli experience. Also, my son does baseball. So baseball is very much an American kind of thing. Um, but, they, but they look at it much differently than, than, than your kids do, I think, because first of all, they live there. Um, for them, Israel, for example, the religious, the religious side of it. We're not religious at all. Um, we do you know, manage the holidays and everything. But, but Israeli kids grow up in school where religion is part of your life. You know, it's, I mean, and, and the holidays are part of your life. I mean, that's, what the, that's the holidays you have. You don't have Christmas, you have Hanukkah. Um, and you don't have Easter, you have Passover. Um, so they all know the stories, they all understand it and hear about it and read about it and, 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 and live it. So it's a much different kind of experience. And also what you're saying about, you know, the, the great problems that are today in Israel. I'm just thinking back, you know, the cafes are filled. My kids live in Tel Aviv. Two of my kids live in Tel Aviv. They go to the cafes. They, they, you can't get a reservation at a restaurant. Um, and, then, and then there's, you know, there's tension in the northern border and there's tension in Gaza Strip. And, you know, Israeli life is just going on as normal. Right. Uh, and, and that's the amazing dichotomy of how, what, what's happening in Israel. Because, I mean, I'm, obviously I, I went there because I'm very proud of it. A lot of Israelis are trying to get to America. I'm not coming back to America. I'm very happy that all my three kids are living there. They all have careers. They all have lives in America. How old are you, Tilda? Um, my daughter is 32 years old, and she's now pregnant with my first grandchild. So what does she you. do? Um, she works in Castro. She's a designer, a fashion designer in Castro. She studied for four years here in New York and now is in Israel and is the designer of all the, the baby clothes for Castro, which is the largest design house in Israel. Okay. Um, my son is involved in finance. He was a lawyer. And now he's involved in finance, very high finance. And my daughter just graduated uh, from, uh, as, a, as a designer as well, as a designer and as a... You've done wonderfully. Yes. That's wonderful. Definitely. Uh, and it's interesting. Your children seem to have a commitment to Israel, yes? Totally, totally, totally. And you, know, you just referred to the fact that the American Jew, let alone the American, but the American Jew who doesn't know Israel intimately right. 
everything he or she knows is what they get from the media. Yes. And the media is going to focus on the conflict. Right. And when you're in Israel, you realize it's a society, a full, complete, vibrant, exciting society, like any other. Yes. But when you're in Tel Aviv, the fact that there's something going on in Gaza or on the Lebanese border or on the Syrian border of the Golan Heights, it's not like it doesn't matter, but it doesn't impact daily life. Right. And life goes on in a, with all the headaches and problems and all the joys of life. Yes? Totally. Completely. And that's why, actually, that's why baseball and this movie was so good. Um, because it showed to the American public for once what, what, what ha what's happening in Israel. Um, that there's more than just the wars going on in Israel. And there's the actual life of baseball and kids going out and playing baseball and being there. Um, you know, just as an example, when we had this, the, the missiles coming in, um, we had, you know, uh, and, and the kids are playing on a field, um, and all of a sudden a missile comes in, they all have to run to the, to the bomb shelters, you know? So there's a rule in the IAB books that says, okay, you just drop your mitts in the place, and you run to the bomb shelters, and the play takes place. Right away when you come back, it takes place, continues from where it left off. Um, and, and the movie, could be, being out with the movie and showing what's happening in Israel and showing this everyday life is an amazing, amazing experience. Mm -hmm. Was there anything as you made the film? By the way, you made it with two other producers. Mm -hmm. Who are, it looks like the three of you are good friends. We're good buddies. Okay. It, it helps. Okay. Their names again? Daniel A. Miller and Seth Kramer. Okay. So Daniel, Seth, and you, as you make this film, was there any surprise for you? I'm not even, but I don't even want to give you a, a theme. Any surprise at all? When you made the film, did you say to yourself, gee, I hadn't thought of that or I hadn't expected that? Whatever the, that is. Yeah, there were, there were surprises every step of the way with this film. Give me an example. Uh, well, for starters, the film was originally going to be about Jewish ballplayers in the minor and major league system. So we went around and interviewed Jewish ballplayers at spring training with Jonathan Mayo. He's the, the fourth producer of the film. He writes for MajorLeagueBaseball.com, and he had relationships with all of the Jewish players. He had been fostering those. He covers the sort of uh, the, the, the beat where, uh, what, what do you call it, prospects. So he knew all the Jewish players, he got us access, and we interviewed Ike Davis, we interviewed Sam Fold, we interviewed Josh Zide. Uh, the These goal guys was what? became... The goal was? The goal was to that time. bring them on a trip to Israel, like a birthright ah. trip, and see how these American Jews, a lot of them who didn't have bar mitzvahs, who didn't really have a Jewish upbringing, would respond to a, a trip to Israel. So we filmed a glorious sizzle reel, which ended up in our Kickstarter video that you saw, and we couldn't get the... The, the funding we needed to bring them to Israel. Now, lo and behold, the same guys we interviewed ended up on the qualifying team in Brooklyn of Team Israel, and then it was game on. So I was first surprised that a film that we had thrown into the you know, cupboard was breathing new life again. And I didn't pay attention to the Brooklyn uh, qualifying series. How uh, honest. I was so angry that our project had yes. fallen apart. I was yes. like, fat, <laughs> I'm not watching this. But then we got the call. Uh, it said, hey, there's a guy in Chicago who's willing to fly you to Israel with the team. I was like, oh, that's what we were planning. So then we had three months to just put it all together. And then they say, oh, you're going on Sheldon Edelson's private jet. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> I mean, that was surprising. And then when we got to the country, these guys are diaspora Jews like I am. And now they're experiencing Israel, which my two partners and I all had done a freshman year of college. We all had been to the holy sites. We had all, you know, culturally mixed it up with Israelis. We knew what to eat. We knew what, you know, to do that was fun. And we were sort of, while they were on the tour filming them, kind of the off-the-beaten-path ambassadors so that, you know, someone like Ike Davis would ask me, hey, where should we go or what should we do? And, you know, the tour was great, but they weren't seeing, from my perspective, the, the Israel that I remember. One particular piece that's in the film is interacting with Palestinians. That was not on the tour. I imagine the tour company was a little bit more on the conservative side, and they were going to Israeli Air Force bases and taking them to the holy sites. So while we were in Jerusalem, uh, I scouted out a cafe you know, in the Arab Quarter where they could experience you know, delicious Turkish coffee and meet some Palestinians, and then took them on a trip of the Shuk where they could go in the market and haggle for you know, tchotchkes and shirts. And, and that, that is a very surprising moment in the film. I won't spoil it. But there's a shop a owner scene. that is an amazing <clears throat> scene mm -hmm. uh, where you don't see it coming. That Someone in the Shook knows more about baseball than the player that's in the, in the shop. So 
I think that there were surprises along the way in how they were interacting with Israel, how they were transforming, because a lot of them went through transformations on that Is trip. that true? Yeah. You saw them grow in some way. Yes, we saw them. Give me an example. Ike Davis shows up. He's not used to being. By the way, because there is at least one person out there yeah. who's not a baseball fan. Okay. Okay. You Ike and, Davis you played and I, the Mets. Yeah. Okay. Slugger, uh, beloved in New York. Totally. Uh, you know, currently retired, but he's been on the Mets, on the Dodgers, on the Yankees. Uh, the Yankees, briefly. Uh, so he he was probably the most recognized player of Team Israel on the trip in Israel because of all the expats that live from New York in Israel. He's who the kids were saying, Ike, Ike, you know, autographs, oh, really? et cetera. Yeah. So Ike gets there. He doesn't really know what to expect. He's not used to being identified as a Jew in public. And here he is in Israel wondering and nervous, like, is this safe for me to be identified this way? And we watched him as he got to experience the culture and the people of Israel and the sights and the sounds and the history really change and you know, feel comfortable to the point where he was contemplating, hey, this could be my homeland. That's a transformation that That's we amazing. witnessed. That's and amazing. there was many of those. And then follow further to Korea and then Japan when they go to the, the WBC tournament. I mean, the film is filled with that kind of surprise elements where you see people growing and kind of coming to terms with what it means to be A, a Jew, be connected to Israel in this very strange way. And I think that's like maybe the most rich part, even if you don't like baseball. Exactly. By the way, what, what you're saying is very important for our audience to hear. One might think you have to be a devotee of baseball to watch this movie. No. As you heard in the open, is if you care about Israel, this is a, a movie that gives you a window into the relationship that American Jews have, just Jews, by the way. The fact that they're baseball players is almost irrelevant. You see people who play baseball for a living, or, you, or did at one time, and they go to Israel for the first time. And the experiences that you capture are done magnificently. And that's why I really recommend this film to anybody watching Lechanim or JBS. And that must give you some satisfaction. Oh, complete satisfaction. I mean. You know, you don't know most of the time when you're making a film if the film is going to be a success, if anyone's going to want to see it. We knew as we were going through uh, following the team that we were onto something. You know what the funniest uh, moment was? I was in Korea. They had just won their third game. And all of a sudden, I mean, Peter's looking at an article about the team in the New York Times. All of a sudden, it just exploded in popularity. They became one of the big stories of the WBC. Exactly right. And I get a phone call from my wife's brother, Jimmy. Jimmy Castratero, not Jewish. This is from you know, the Italian side of the family. Jimmy has never cared about any of the films I've ever produced. Jimmy likes to watch Yankee games every night. He's not as, uh, let's say, cultured in the you know, documentary world as, as, as I would hope he would be to come see our films. But I got a text from him that it must have been like midnight or one in the morning that said, are you still with Team Israel? Amazing, all caps, <laughs> exclamation points. That's when I knew we were, we were with something really special going on. That's lovely. Anything surprise you as you saw the film being made and saw what was going to be captured? Or when you watch the film, anything surprise you? I was surprised by, by everything that went on. I mean, everything for me was new. Um, being in the WBC, having these players over in Israel was an incredible experience. Being Why? together with them. Why? Because first of all, you see the perspective of them seeing Israel through their eyes. Um, and you learn how all of a sudden, you know, in the, in the first couple of days we were in Tel Aviv, in the Tel Aviv area. Okay, Tel Aviv is, you know, a hot city and everything, and they're going out to the bars, and they're having a good time, and the beaches, and the nice women and everything. And that was good, and that got them a little bit warmed up and everything. Um, but then we went to Jerusalem, or, or actually then we went to the Baptist Village, which is where our field is in Petach Tikva, where the main field is. We had there hundreds of kids. As soon as they came off the buses, the kids just went up to them and everything, autographs, uh, asking for, you know, selfies, doing selfies with them. And they were so accommodating. I think they had a selfie or an autograph with every kid that was there. Um, there was one scene in the movie, actually, where, the, where Ike's, Ike uh, has his, uh, sh his cleats dirty left shoes, over, his dirty yeah. shoes. And, and, and they give it to a kid. He sides it for the kid and everything. The kids were just amazed to see everybody. And they're Jewish ballplayers. We get a lot of, a lot of ballplayers coming to Israel. Um, just in two weeks, Andrew Jones is coming to visit Israel. Because uh, they come to the Holy Land, they come to see it, and they come to do clinics for our kids. But these were Jewish ballplayers who were going to play for Team Israel. Not only that, they saw them um, two months later in the WBC, winning in Korea, going to Tokyo. It was an incredible experience for the kids there to see them. 
They went out to the field. They did batting practice. They were doing home runs. They were hitting the ball. I, was, I told them every time they owe me $5 because each ball cost me $5. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but baseballs don't, they don't, they don't grow in Israel. Um, but, but they were just doing everything for the kids. And, and three days later, they came to Beit Shemesh. Beit Shemesh is where we're going to put our first field um, after the Baptist village. And they had a ceremony there, and they even planted a ball. Uh, the mayor, together with them, planted a ball in the ground for the, so it's grow, it should grow into a stadium. Um, and it was just such an incredible experience to see Israel through their eyes. And then later on, when we went to Korea, these 10 guys um, came together with a team of 26 players. And they started talking to them about Israel, talking to them about, about representing Israel, and how their, their visit was so incredible there. And the other guys got involved in it and came together. For most of these players, you'll see when you, when, you, when you talk to them or when you listen to them, for them it was the most incredible experience for them in baseball, being in the WBC and playing for Team Israel. It was just an incredible feeling, an incredible motion um, of being there. It was less so in Israel, I think. The, the people who were involved in, is, in baseball in Israel are, are very, very, very pleased by it. Um, but I think the average Israeli is, is more like, you know, okay, they're Americans, they're not, you know, they're not us, they're not Israelis. They even mentioned it in the news. <clears throat> when we were on the news, the, the broadcast, the guy was talking about how they're, they're just Jewish American ballplayers, they're not really Israelis, and they're playing for Team Israel. He went back three days later, and he apologized for that, and he had a broadcast with me on there, because I told him, listen, these guys came to Israel, they left their careers, they're playing for Team Israel in the WBC, they have Israel across their chest, there couldn't be people who are more more wanting to play for Israel, more attuned to playing for Israel. By the way, I'm putting together an Olympic team now for the 2020 Olympics, an Israel baseball team. Four of those guys are making Aliyah, are going to be becoming Israeli citizens, and they're going to be playing for Israel if we, if we go through the different rounds. If we're able to advance, they'll be playing for us in the Olympics. I'm sorry, who? Four of our players. Four of our players from the WBC team are going through the process of, with Nefesh Benefesh of making okay, Aliyah. Okay, what? American Jews. American Jews are becoming Israelis. They're getting Israeli citizenship so they can play so with Israel can, yes. in the Olympic team because the Olympic team has to be a national team of nationals. Um, and I'm, I'm also working on Ike Davis. I'll be seeing him in a couple of days and trying to get him to make a citizenship and become an Israeli. But these people, these guys, these American Jewish players are so identifying with it that they want to become Israelis also and they want to help Israel further in baseball. These may not be, these are not necessarily major league baseball players. No, they're all minor leaguers. They're all right. minor leaguers because the major leaguers won't be able to play in the, in the Olympics. Um, but the minor leaguers, hopefully they won't advance to the major leagues until 2020. I'm taking a chance. That's okay. I'm willing to take a chance. Um, but we're, we're working with four of these guys um, who are going to be coming to Israel in October, by the way. They're going to be coming to Israel in October. They'll be giving clinics in Israel in October. They'll be getting their passports in October and becoming real Israelis in October. And from there, we'll take it from there. Okay. I want you to reflect for me on that, on this sort of complicated and in some way sensitive topic. Jewish ball players playing for Team Israel. Right. And the difference in the Jewish <coughs> world between national identity and a sense of family. You and I understand what it is to be a Jew, all three of us understand, to be a Jew is part of a family. And it doesn't matter where Jews live. What your wife did was she joined the family. Okay. But the way in which nations are constructed, one would imagine that to play for, I don't know, Puerto Rico. You came from Puerto Rico, or your parents came from Puerto Rico. It wasn't that you simply are Spanish. You have a tie to Puerto Rico. In this instance, there was something different. It's a different model. It's not about any of these ball players who had let necessarily family in Israel or whose families came from Israel. They were simply Jews. And because there was this because there is a right of return, they could at any time potentially become Israeli citizens. Right. And as a result, American Jews who by the way, we're not actively Jewish. Many of these ball players, when you talk to a Kevin Euclid, this is not an active Jew. Ike Davis is not an active Jew. But there's something somewhere in him. He knows he's a Jew, and he now has a connection to Israel of a potential nature, not necessarily an active nature. And yet, all of these Jews, American Jews, with a very tangential Jewish involvement, tangential Jewish commitment, end up playing for Team Israel. And somebody could stand opposite you and say, 
you know, there's something that doesn't feel right about that. You're a Jew who made Aliyah. You cared the, You grew up in a Zionist home. Peter, how do you for yourself personally reconcile the tangential nature of the American Jewish ball player, major league ball player, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden <coughs> he's wearing a uniform across which it says Israel. And in part, that's what you're referencing when you talk about how Israelis viewed it and how at one point some Israelis sort of minimizing the fact that a Jewish ball player from America is part of Team Israel. Right. Just speak to that. That's a very complicated issue. Is it? <laughs> it's certainly a complicated, very complicated issue. It's the whole issue of, of, of the identification with Jewish Americans with Israel. Um, is being Jewish a religion? Is it a heritage? Um, what does it mean? Is it being part of a family? Um, I think many Israelis, the non-religious ones, as I'm part of that, non-religious ones, don't look at, the Ju at Judaism as, a as necessarily just a religion. It is not a religion. It is not a religion. It's a it heritage. It is a family. It's a family. It's a family. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And that's, the, that's what I tried to instill on these Jewish American ballplayers, and I think we succeeded very well. That's also why it was very important for me after the qualifiers to have a visit to Israel of the ten main ballplayers. And that's why it was very important to have this, this visit going on, because I had to have them see what they were playing for and to understand what they're playing for to see the kids in Israel, to see the fields in Israel, to see what fields you want to develop, what the baseball program is like in Israel. So they'll all tell you, uh, after they came and right now, they'll tell you the main goal of, baseball, of Israel baseball is to develop local Israeli players. To develop, they, they, they shouldn't, a team Israel in 20 years or even 10 years shouldn't have uh, Jewish American ball players playing for that. It should have only Israelis playing for them, which is what we're trying to do, which is what we're trying, but we can't do it today. Although, today, by the way, in all honesty, that would be an unfair burden to place on Team Israel. Until Mike Piazza does not want to play for what kind what Team Italy. Team Italy. Right. As long as Mike Piazza is playing for Team Italy, right. yet if Sandy Koufax wants to come out of retirement uh -huh. and play for Team Israel, we'll I'm him. all for it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take it at the age of 75. <laughs> but, I mean, Israel you know, is a country of 8 million people. Um, but also the Dominican Republic, I don't think, has more than that. It has even a smaller population, and they're baseball crazy. Now, I don't, wanna, I don't think that Israel will become the Dominican Republic of baseball. Um, but certainly the goal is, the eventual goal is, to have Israelis play baseball and develop the game. That's why we want to build the field yes, also. Yes, and we want ultimately Team Israel to have a majority yes. of native Israeli exactly. ball players. Exactly. Even if there are some Americans who join, right. who are American, Jewish, Jewish Americans. Right. Yes, just as Mike Piazza can... Do that? Yes, there can be a ball player from, but you want the team to be indigenous to Israel, which was That's, not true this time. Right, no, it was not true this time. That's why it was important for me to have them come visit and to do a birthright trip of ball players coming to visit and knowing what they were playing for uh, because it's great having them there. It's great from, you know, we were ranked number 41 in the world, Team Israel, and now we're ranked number 17 in the world. So, we, you know, we advanced because of the American Jews, not because of the Israelis, and they helped us, which was great, but I also want them to feel what they were playing for. And this trip certainly helped doing, do that. And also when they came back and they were in Korea with the other, 20, the other 16 players, they instilled that on them. And now you're seeing it. Now you're seeing more players are coming to Israel. They want to come visit me in October. They're gonna, four guys are making Aliyah. It's, it's growing. It's developing. It's going in that direction of bringing that connection between Israelis and American okay. Jews through baseball. And if, if someone were to ask either of you, I want to hear both of you speak to this. This wasn't Team Israel. This was Team Jew. It should have been the word Jew across the... <laughs> Because they were all Jews, they were all part of a family, right. but they weren't Israeli. If somebody said, why, didn't the why, why was it Team Israel, it should have been Team Jew, you would say? I would say, look at the Cuban reporter who asked Jerry Weinstein in the press conference, this is in the movie, it's Team America 2 or Team America 3, why is that? And Jerry said, I don't care, we played by the rules, and those are the rules, and that's what we played by. Absolutely. It's true that it's Team American Jew, but they played for a country, which was Israel. And they play, and the J American Jewish people, when they, when they do something, they do it for Israel. And Israel is the country they played for. Israel is who they did that for. And Israel knows that, that the American Jews are supporting them, and they're supporting the American That's Jews. That's beautiful. Anything to add? I would say look at some of the people who live in Israel. Look at Peter. Is he a Jew or is he an Israeli? Both. He's, no, he's both, both, right? He, he made out yeah. what good fortune that our film crew was dealing with Peter and the ball team was dealing with Peter when we were pitching, hey, can we come to Israel and make this film? Imagine if it wasn't. Someone like Peter who looks like he could be, you know, tailoring my jacket here <laughs> on the Lower East Side. Uh, imagine with Israeli, he'd be like, 
you know, can we make a film about this baseball team? You mind if we're coming? Baseball? Uh, look, it's not very important here, you know? We have three fields. Uh, two of them are minefields. We, you just imagine we would have been shut down immediately. So I think the character of Israel is a uh, melting pot of people, and a lot of Americans and expats live there. And as diaspora Jews, we're connected because it's our family who's over there. That's why we plant so many trees. Each of you are baseball fans as well. Yeah, yeah. Yankee fan, Mets Mets fan. fan. Um, you and I are closer in age. Some of the th people who were important to you on the Mets were important to me. Because I'm older, I start with Jackie Robinson. Okay. Jackie Robinson is my first hero, and he also has a profound influence on me, how I view the world and, different, and the struggle of the black community and my identification with that struggle. And then my second hero is Tom Seaver, who I know is yours, right? Among others, yes. Among <laughs> others. Name some of the others. Uh, from that team, Jerry Grody. Really, I was always a catcher. I always identified with the catchers on that team. <laughs> so Jerry Grody, Jerry Koosman, I mean, I can name you all 25 Wasn't guys. Wasn't that run in 69, out of Incredible. this world? Yep. Out of this world. Totally. Yes, <laughs> yeah. So do you have any chance of getting some of the baseball stars, having to do whether they're Jewish or not, to come to Israel because you are promoting the game. Is there a chance Tom Seaver would one day come to Israel for this? Have you thought of trying to get, some, let alone Sandy Gove? Sandy Gove is a very private man. Yes. Very hard to, get, to do anything. Right. But there are, there are people who, either because they like the limelight, or they might like a trip to Israel, mm -hmm or they might come if they had paid, that they would come and help Israel's, Israel develop baseball. Right. Well, first of all, we're, we're bringing, we bring coaches to Israel. Now, we, we received uh, a lot of money from the WBC for reaching sixth place. Um, a great bulk of that money is going to the fields in Beit Shemesh and Renana that you mentioned in the beginning to help build those fields. And hopefully, Bezrat Hashem, we can start building those fields before the end of this year. And that's what we're trying to do right now. Um, our second thing that we did with the money was to bring coaches, actual coaches to Israel, European coaches, American coaches, to come there and to spend a week or two weeks with our players and improve the quality of the play. The play has improved dramatically. The IAB has an academy, a baseball academy, where we have our, our younger players uh, training there, and that's what we've done also. We also are bringing um, professional players to Israel because they're coming to Israel. They're coming to visit Israel. Um, Robinson Cano, unfortunately, he was just, uh, just uh, fined for 80 games, but Robinson Cano was in Israel this past winter and came to the Baptist Village and spent three hours with our guys in the Baptist Village uh, teaching them and, and, and hitting home runs. Fabulous. Uh, Andrew Jones is coming in two weeks to Israel, and he's going to be with our guys in the field. Um, more he plays for the Baltimore Orioles. He played for the Baltimore Orioles. Yeah, he's retired. Um, but more and more guys are coming to visit. More and more players are coming to visit Israel and then spend time together with us. And, and then our four WBC players who are making Aliyah will be coming to Israel in October, and they'll be doing clinics. They'll be spending two weeks going all over the country doing clinics for all the kids. You can't imagine the kids when they come there and when they see that. I remember when my son was 12 years old, two pitchers for the, uh, for the Atlanta Braves. This was uh, 1998 or something like that. Um, two pitchers from the Atlanta Braves came. He got a wristband. He, never he didn't take it off for three months <laughs> when they gave that out. It makes such an effect on the kids living in Israel when players come and they're there and they're doing clinics and they're visiting with them and they're seeing them. It's incredible. The team, the visit of Team Israel um, when the guys were there in, uh, in January of 2017 was, was an incredible, had an incredible effect on all the kids. Yes, and we should acknowledge what they call football, what we call soccer. Right. That's the sport in Israel. Yes, that's the big sport. And okay. basketball. That's, and basketball. Also. And basketball, absolutely, right. would be number two. Right. Um, I don't know whether baseball can ever catch on to that extent, but first of all, for many Americans who live in Israel, if there were some quality baseball, I think it would be nice for them. Sure. And it may be that there are Israelis who will really become captivated by the game. It's a, look, you, you always hear people say it's a different speed. Baseball is criticized for being too slow. I never find, boy, I find it, the slowness never bothers me. That's the most honest way to say it. Right. Um, but it would, uh, it would be a kick for me if one day baseball were a game that was really part of the Israeli scene. You talk about how there's an affinity, a con a, an affinity for Jews and baseball here in this country. Yes? Yeah, absolutely. Um, why do you think that's true? Well, baseball is something where fathers take their sons to games. 
I mean, it's like a tradition that's passed down to generation to generation, just like Judaism. There's a lot of parallels. It's also a sport where there were some very public early Jewish heroes in the sport, uh, which we know is not the case in a lot of sports. And I think uh, the success of New York teams where huge population centers of Jews lived, it really fostered a connection between Judaism and baseball. It's undeniable. You know, my grandfather, he comes from, he, he gets smicha from the Slobodka Yeshiva in Lithuania. Mm -hmm. He comes to America. It doesn't work out for him as a rabbi. So he becomes a, he goes out to the Midwest and he becomes, he's a peddler and then he becomes a businessman. He does very well. I never imagined him without what, what was then a transistor radio mm -hmm. by his ear listening to a baseball game. And we grew up when there were three baseball teams in New York. There were the Dodgers, the Giants, and the Yankees. That meant you almost could have a game every single day. Right. And he, his business was in, in Ohio. He was a passionate Cincinnati Reds fan. So I grow up, there's baseball all around me, but primarily because of my grandfather. And you know, we had one of the first very small RCA TVs. And then they, on PIX, they began showing the Yankee game or the Giant game. Both were on PIX, so they couldn't be on at the same time, but you would see one game or the other. And the Dodgers were, I think, were on OR. And so there was always a game on or there was a game in his ear. And in some way, it became associated for me with being Jewish. Mm -hmm. Does that resonate for you in any way? It, it totally resonates. When I was growing up here in the 60s, uh, I had a better chance of being a Jewish owner than a Jewish player. There were more Jewish owners than there were Jewish players. Today, there's a real renaissance of, of Jewish baseball players. There are 15 players in the major leagues. Um, unfortunately, most of them, I think maybe one or two, have two Jewish parents, and all the rest have just one Jewish parent. Alex Bregman is the best example of, uh, of, a, of a guy who has two Jewish parents and is very well, is, you know, very well understands where he is in the Jewish world. Um, but today, there's, there's hundreds of minor leaguers. There are hundreds of minor leaguers who play baseball. Um, and it's, it's, you know, as the, guy, as the guy who needs to find out what's going on in terms of uh, 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 populating my WBC team, um, it's very interesting to see all these guys coming out of the woodwork all of a sudden and telling me that they're, you know, they happen to be Jewish and they like to play for Team Israel as well. Um, there's definitely more Jewish identity in baseball um, than any other sport. There's no doubt about it. Um, there's more appreciation for the, for the game. I think also in Israel, um, my goal is to have baseball, which today, baseball and softball together, which is today in terms of popu uh, the people that participate, it's probably the number six or seven sport in Israel to be the number three sport. I really want to get up there after soccer and basketball to have baseball, softball be up there. That would be lovely. And I think it will take another, listen, we're building two fields. And as they say, when you build it, they will come. <laughs> and there's no doubt that if we build these two fields in these two locations, more kids will be playing, more kids will come out and play, they'll understand the game, they'll appreciate it more. And that's, that's our goal in the end. I wish you every success. Thank you. Before we close, if people want to see your film, how do they see your film? And you know, I want a closing comment from you. As a filmmaker, as a passionate Jew Zionist, I want to hear what this really means to you as you now step back and look at it. So first tell us, our audience, how do we see it? <clears throat> and, what's, yeah. and what did it mean? What's it, as you look back, what's it mean to you? So Jeremy. right now, the, the film is touring the film festival circuit. We've been at like 30 Jewish film festivals. The film will be eventually in theaters, I think sometime in July, August, and then your audience can see it. Uh, it and it's great. The audiences are really loving this film. It's a crowd pleaser. It's the first film I've done where in the audience during the film, they're cheering when the team wins, like they're at the ball field. It's really peculiar. Audiences don't usually do that. So... I think when the audience gets to it, they're going to love it. Uh, in terms of like just looking at the experience of what does it mean? Yes. I mean, this is my seventh film, uh, my first Jewish film. And I knew I wanted to do a Jewish project. Uh, it's sort of something that's always in your mind as a Jew that you want to bring your Judaism to work at some point. So when my two partners and I uh, start talking to Jonathan Mayo, and this was working out. It was very exciting because this was going to be uh, the perfect Jewish project. It brought in sort of pop culture. It brought in sports and fun. And uh, it brought in Zionism. It just had it, it had it all. So 
I think we just we lucked out. We hit a grand slam home run. I mean, I pinch myself that we were able to get access to the team. And we got access to the team you know, from Peter, so we're grateful when they were on their trip to Israel. It was then that we had to beg Major League Baseball to let us come to Korea and Japan and raise money and, and the rest. So I think it was a miracle that it all worked out. But to be a fly on the wall when Team Israel does this incredible Cinderella story, I mean, we were lucky. We got lucky. You did a fabulous job. Your film makes Jews feel proud. And what you're doing, both of you, is a major contribution to Jewish life and to the state of Israel. I wish you both kol tuva hatzlachah. You should only have success wherever you go, anytime you make a film. I wish you all the success in the world as you try to grow the sport of baseball in Israel. And I hope both of you will stay in touch with me. And if there are other reasons that I can have you on, and you can tell me the next chapter of the story, okay. we should stay in touch. Definitely. As baseball grows, I want to hear about it here mm -hmm. on L'chaim. Okay. And if there's anything you do in your next films of a Jewish nature, you come and you talk to me about it. Fair enough? Yeah, it makes sense. Fantastic. It is a joy to Thank meet you, you so both. Much. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you very, very Thank much, you. both of you. What a pleasure. <laughs> next time you come to Israel, come to a game. <laughs> I will come to a game, okay. and you'll make sure I get great seats. No, I want you to throw out the first pitch. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I made a deal. Oh, oh, throw out the first pitch. That's are you it. kidding? <laughs> are you kidding? You got me there. Uh -huh. All right. Peter Kurz, president of the Israeli Association of Baseball. Jeremy Neuberger, produ producer-director of the film Heading Home, The Tale of Team Israel. Uh, both individuals who are making a major contribution to Jewish life, each in their own way. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to any of the ideas expressed here on this edition of L'Chaim. Please email me, write me, post on our Facebook wall, or tweet me. I look forward to hearing from many of you. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'Chaim, my friends, to life. of Jewish education in media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.